The year is 1781. In the final battle of the Revolutionary War, colonial forces under General George Washington defeat the army of the most powerful empire on Earth. It is the beginning of a great union of colonies that will become America. In one of these colonies, another kind of organization will be formed this year. One that will have a profound effect on the health and well-being of the citizens of Massachusetts and indeed all the citizens of these United States for centuries to come. In the 18th century, the very concept of being a doctor was radically different than it is today. There was no structure to the medical profession or set of standards to follow. Literally anyone could say they were a doctor without any form of certification. The profession at present is not upon ye most reputable footing, and the want of conversation, candor, and generosity very much obstruct the growth of medical knowledge and give great advantage to the ignorant and designing. Physicians were aware of the problems facing their profession, but affecting change was easier said than done. They were often isolated and faced health crises too big to solve on their own. One man was finally able to bring Massachusetts doctors together to solve the health challenges of their day. His name was John Warren. Warren and other leading physicians of the day petitioned the state legislature to form the Massachusetts Medical Society. The design of the institution is to promote medical and surgical knowledge, inquiries into the animal economy, and the promotion and effects of medicine by encouraging a free intercourse with the gentlemen of the faculty throughout the United States of America and a friendly correspondence with the eminent in those professions throughout the world. It was the start of a remarkable transformation from individuals scattered across the Commonwealth to the first professional community of physicians all united by a commitment to common principles. One of the key powers the legislature gave the medical society was the authority to, in effect, license physicians. Better trained doctors became military doctors during the revolution, and that sort of left a vacuum behind of people who were less well trained or when they came back from the revolution, they were a little appalled at some of the people who were doing this. So, so that was one of the reasons for setting some standards. And for a hundred years until 1894, the society was the licensing body of Massachusetts. The things that brought the medical society together in 1781 are as relevant today as they were then. There is an unbroken thread of history that connects the past to the present. In the beginning, the Massachusetts Medical Society was a literal family composed of fathers, sons, and grandsons. Father-son mentorship was and remained the most prevalent form of medical training until the mid-19th century. Though few had access to formal education, the Medical Society's early members helped to bring about advancements that changed the face of medicine and saved countless lives. Benjamin Waterhouse brought Jenner's smallpox vaccine to America, inoculating his own sons to demonstrate the safety and effectiveness of the vaccine. Oliver Wendell Holmes wrote his groundbreaking dissertation on purple fever, saving the lives of many women who were dying of infection after childbirth. And a father-son team performed the first operation under ether anesthesia. As the patient regained consciousness, Dr. John Collins Warren assured his audience, Gentlemen, this is no humbug. That was a major reason for the formation by Warren and others for the Massachusetts Medical Society, to present new information, to share experiences, and to d discuss uh, the significance of a given clinical finding or the therapeutic effect of then some crude drugs. Equally important as the medical advancements, was the fellowship that the Medical Society inspired among physicians. It's always good, sir, for men engaged in the same pursuits and objects to meet together in a body and look upon each other's faces and spend a few hours in mutual interchange of thought and feeling. 
Just as medical advancements were taking place, however, other health challenges arose that shook the foundations of Massachusetts society. In the mid-19th century, waves of immigrants poured into cities, including many thousands fleeing the Great Potato Famine in Ireland. The Industrial Revolution sparked an influx of factory workers, overwhelming cities and forcing people to live in cramped, squalid conditions. Many didn't live for long. The Massachusetts Medical Society responded. In 1850, Lemuel Shattuck put out a historic report that stressed several key findings that are relevant to public health. That report, which was endorsed by the Medical Society, served as a foundation for founding the first State Board of Health, which was the forerunner for our Massachusetts Department of Public Health. That was founded uh, in 1869. And the Medical Society was a key leader then in petitioning state leaders to establish that public authority. And um, that was the beginning of a tremendous public health transfer transformation in our state. The Medical Society was also able to focus on making improvements that would elevate medicine as a profession. To bring about change, they used the same effective standards-based approaches used to tackle public health issues. A physician shall be dedicated to providing competent medical care with compassion and respect for human dignity and rights. Bringing together a group of doctors to develop a code of ethics was revolutionary for the time. They were really the beginnings of a structure for measuring competency and quality of care. The work of the Massachusetts Medical Society in its first era made a measurable difference in people's lives. It was an auspicious start that helped lay the foundation for both the future of medicine and a whole new era for the Massachusetts Medical Society, marked by evolution and change. The 20th century would bring its own challenges, fueled by a culture going through constant transformation. The Medical Society began to leverage the prestige it had earned over the previous 120 years to more widely disseminate medical knowledge and to protect the viability of physicians' practices in the face of mounting pressures so that doctors could continue to deliver quality care to the citizens of the Commonwealth. One of the greatest achievements of this era was the purchase and development of the New England Journal of Medicine, whose growth mirrored that of the Medical Society as it rose to become the preeminent medical publication in the world. The journal had its roots in 1812, when John Collins Warren and James Jackson partnered to form the New England Journal of Medicine and Surgery to publicize the most current and innovative events taking place in medical science and practice. As the journal evolved, so did the groundbreaking nature of its content. In the 1960s, the journal earned worldwide acclaim and saw its circulation quadruple. What made the journal special in the U.S. was that it was not perceived to be an organ of any specific group but rather just a journal where the medicine mattered. Then my predecessors made some brilliant decisions, papers to publish, really critical papers in the 60s and in the 70s. And so other scientists and physicians saw this, and they sent papers to the journal because you want your work to be associated with the journal that's published high quality work in the past. The early 20th century saw the Massachusetts Medical Society evolve into a body that could advocate for and catalyze widespread positive change in public health and in the field of medicine itself, not just in Massachusetts, but across the United States. Rising membership gave the Medical Society more power to speak with a unified voice for change on a broader scale. In 1938, as America continued to struggle through the Great Depression, the Medical Society voted to petition Congress and President Roosevelt to support legislation to strengthen existing federal regulations in order to protect the public. Washington listened. The objective of adequate medical care in our free society is to make available to everyone, regardless of race, color, creed, financial status, or place of residence, every known essential preventive, diagnostic, and curative medical service of high quality. The Medical Society's advocacy efforts also extended to helping create the next generation of physicians. Harvard, Boston University, and Tufts all had excellent medical schools, 
yet even these three could not accommodate all the qualified candidates who wanted to become doctors. In 1969, the Medical Society endorsed the construction of the University of Massachusetts Medical School. Lamar Souter, a president of the Medical Society, became the first dean. The next 25 years would see the Massachusetts Medical Society evolve to meet the challenges of a new era while holding fast to its guiding principles. Sweeping technological changes were rapidly transforming and revolutionizing the world of medicine. But modern medical miracles have come at a price, putting new strains on a healthcare delivery system already struggling with complex issues. Malpractice insurers who fled the state in the 1970s had sparked a crisis of availability. Ten years later, the crisis boiled over again as soaring premiums threatened to force many physicians out of medicine. It was truly a crisis in healthcare in Massachusetts, and we emphasized how the patients were losing access to their physicians. We sat there watching this group of six legislators trying to hammer out this legislation. I finally said, that's it. I'm leaving. I'm going to go to the local television station, and I'm going to tell the public that you really don't care about their health care. And they challenged me and said, it's quarter of 11. You won't have time to do it. I said, oh, yes, I'll just walk down the hill to Channel 7, and I'm sure I can get on the program. That did it. They moved so quickly after that that by midnight we had legislation passed. Though multiple initiatives were implemented, no lasting solution has yet been found. There weren't any insurers who were willing to write malpractice in the 1980s, so the state legislature formed the Joint Underwriting Association to address that issue. Now we have an affordability issue that is continuing to pressure doctors. The 1980s also saw the beginning of a new dynamic. The tension between physicians and insurers as physicians struggled to provide quality medical care to their patients while insurers aggressively tried to control costs. The first major skirmish between the two was the society's attempt to use the courts to curb Blue Cross payment policies. It was a spirited battle, but it ended in defeat. This eventually led the society to a new approach. Rather than go it alone, it would work with like-minded allies, such as patient advocacy groups, to force insurers to put patients first. In the mid-90s, the medical society's efforts led to accelerating progress and renewed momentum in this area. And so that's really what happened in the mid-90s when the Medical Society, Partners Healthcare, Blue Cross, Children's Hospital, Healthcare for All, the American Cancer Society, a host of organizations said, you know, we think there's a window of opportunity to achieve something big in 1995 or 1996, and maybe if we work together, we can be much more effective in making it go as far as possible. A similar effort led the Medical Society to lead the push for the first comprehensive physician profiling law in the country, a startling development that was emulated throughout the nation. This medical society is very unusual amongst medical societies in the sense that it frequently takes a leadership position and profiling is one good example. I think it was the beginning of our relationship with the Massachusetts legislature uh, and some of the citizens' organizations involved where they felt that the Mass Medical Society could take a reasonable position and listen to the concerns of the patients. And that led over the years to a much better relationship with our legislators. And I think it, it in the long run, uh, enhanced the quality of care for the patients of Massachusetts. Medical Society physicians led a team that worked in concert with others to craft a set of managed care reforms. Reforms that not only became law, but have endured through the years and are the foundation of medical care today. We put the health plans together and the physicians together as advocates for their patients. Put them all in a room and have them battle it out. And it would turn out to be a wonderful idea because Clearly, the common interest and the common grounds and 
some basic principles that we all could agree with, but we covered 95% of the problem. This third era has seen the Medical Society continue to advocate not only for quality medical care in Massachusetts, but also for its citizens' safety and well-being, shedding light on difficult problems that others were hesitant to tackle. Many of our patients suffer the health care consequences of violence. But if we get to the root cause, we can do a lot to help our patients in ways that we never imagined possible even 20 years ago. The Medical Society is a driving force behind the adoption of new information technologies, providing physicians and patients alike with more efficient ways to communicate and digest the latest knowledge. And I think this is just the beginning. I think that a lot of medical information will in fact be conveyed uh, through the use of audio and video and that we now have that capability. People submit papers, and they submit audio files and video files, we review them, and when they're pertinent, we put them up. So it uses the entire capacity of the web in a way that was never possible before. The society's willingness to evolve with the times has not been limited to technology. It has recognized the changing face of both the medical community and the nation at large, and has made a renewed commitment to promoting inclusion and diversity within its membership. But with millions of citizens still without health care, there was clearly more work to be done. The Medical Society continued to partner with coalitions of healthcare organizations, patients, and lawmakers to create real change. Finally, in 2006, a major breakthrough was achieved. Every generation in every era of the Massachusetts Medical Society has fought to define medicine in its own time, to ask hard questions, envision possibilities, come together to improve patient care and preserve the viability of physicians' practices. The Massachusetts Medical Society has the uh, ability, it has the idealism uh, to keep those ideals alive and to keep physicians uh, true to what brought them to the profession to begin with. The thread of history binds today's Medical Society members with those of the past, and we feel honored to share our legacy and principles with them. In the coming years, medicine will evolve in truly revolutionary ways providing unprecedented opportunities for advancing human health. It's up to today's Medical Society members to harness this change and to drive it. If we want equal care and equal quality out uh, outcomes, then we have to really work hard in terms of uh, looking um, intrinsically at all the factors that affect health care. I would like to see us be a beacon for quality, safety, the patient-physician relationship, we can lead by example, we can lead by our track record, uh, we can lead by our ethics.